When we look back at the Tudor dynasty, it was an era famed for its bloodshed. During the reign of King Henry VIII, hundreds of men would lose their heads on the executioner's scaffold. Conversely, very few noble women would meet their ends in this same manner. In fact, there are only six women throughout the entire Tudor dynasty who met this fate. Two queens consort, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, two female sovereigns, albeit one uncrowned, Lady Jane Grey and Mary, Queen of Scots, and two noblewomen, Lady Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, and perhaps the least well-known and most villainised, Jane Boleyn, Viscountess Rochford. Even those who have heard of Jane often look upon her with a certain amount of disdain. To many, she is the essence of a bitter and deceitful wife intent on bringing down her husband, who would in turn meet the same end as the man that she had deliberately conspired to destroy. But to solely focus on this is to also massively overlook Jane's extraordinary life, who served in the household of the first five of Henry VIII's wives, meaning that she literally saw all of the most juicy drama from the reign of England's most infamous monarch. Moreover, how fair is the assessment of Jane that still persists to this day? Was she the most evil woman at the Tudor court? Was she truly the villain that we have been led to believe? Or was she merely a victim of the high-pressured machinations of the Tudor court, and since then been at the mercy of less than accurate depictions in historical fiction, film and television? Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast, Episode 7, Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, Villain or Victim. Jane was born Lady Jane Parker in Norfolk around 1505. Like most high-born women of the time, sadly we have no definitive date of birth. Her father, Henry Parker, 10th Baron Morley, was a popular figure at the court of Henry VIII, and was seen by many as a man of considerable literary achievements, often being called on to translate foreign documents, for example. Henry Parker and his wife, Alice St. John, had three daughters who all survived into adulthood, Margaret, Jane and Alice. So Jane, we believe, was the middle child. With no sons, it was crucial for Henry Parker that he made good marriages for his daughters, and in Jane, he certainly achieved that goal. By 1525, she was married to George Boleyn, brother of Anne Boleyn, who would of course go on to become Henry VIII's scandalous second wife. Despite this event taking place seven years before Anne's own marriage, by this time she was already well established at court when the rise of the Boleyns seemed meteoric. Even without Anne's impending ascension to the highest position a woman in the land could achieve, the marriage to George was still highly advantageous for the Parker family. George was the only surviving son of Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Wiltshire, and Lady Elizabeth Howard, a sister of the country's premier noble, the Duke of Norfolk. As the son of an earl, George was a Viscount in his own right, making Jane a Viscountess, which immediately meant that she technically outranked both her mother and father. George and Jane were given Grimston Manor in Norfolk as a wedding present by the king, but soon upgraded to the Palace of Bewley in Essex as their chief residence. Bewley was a stunning property, and the couple decorated the palace lavishly, installing a tennis court, chapel, and a bathroom, with hot and cold running water, which was still something of a novelty in Tudor England. Yes, hot and cold water, folks. The Tudors were a lot cleaner than we give them credit. The marriage between George and Jane has often been viewed as unhappy, and at times even violent. This has been enormously exacerbated through the highly inaccurate portrayal of George Boleyn in the Showtime series The Tudors, in which George is portrayed firstly as bisexual, for which there is zero evidence, but also very aggressive, for in one scene he forcibly rapes Jane. George has also suffered via the pen over the years, for George Cavendish, Cardinal Wolsey's biographer, described George as having lived an almost bestial existence, forcing widows and deflowering virgins. George's sexual appetite is regularly commented on. There is simply no evidence to prove any of those points. It was said that he was a man who was considerably good-looking, and as brother to the Queen, he would reach the very heights of the Tudor hierarchy, 
with all of the benefits that came with it, but this doesn't automatically mean that he was a Lothario or rapist. From what we can tell, George and Jane's marriage was not exactly perfect, although how many actually were, particularly in the nobility, where the idea of love was, at best, something you could hope for. A piece of evidence which people often use to up the supposed lovelessness of their marriage was the lack of any children born to the couple despite their marriage lasting 11 years. In a time when securing the dynasty with healthy sons was the primary purpose of marriage amongst the nobility in particular, this suggests to many that there was an estrangement between the two. And this is certainly compelling, but is it not possible that George and Jane were incapable of having children? What people who suggest that George was sleeping with anything that walked failed to acknowledge or recognise is that there was never any talk of George having illegitimate children, not so much as a whisper. So maybe their lack of issue was a matter of inability over poor marital relations. When Anne Boleyn became queen in 1533, Jane herself became one of the most senior women in the country. As the sister-in-law of the queen, her position within the court was unassailable. Naturally, as a close member of kin, she would join the queen's household. Like so much of Jane Boleyn's story, though, it is often claimed, inaccurately, that she had a poor relationship with Anne, but there simply is no evidence for this, at least as best as we can tell towards the start of Anne's reign. If anything, the evidence points to a strong working relationship between Anne and her sister-in-law, for in 1534, Jane worked with Queen Anne to uncover an affair that it was suspected Henry VIII was having. Anne enlisted Jane and the two went sort of all Miss Marple, attempting to discover who the lady in question was. Now to me, this speaks volumes about the two women's relationship, for Anne clearly felt of Jane as family, and trusted her enough to play a role in helping to uncover a problem in the royal marriage. This shows a clear level of trust between Anne and Jane. This was a moment for the Berlin women to come together for the good of the family name, Jane's family name, and she duly played her part. Now, unfortunately, it did Jane no favours, because when Henry VIII discovered what had happened, he furiously banished Jane from the court, and she would not return for several months. Three years later, in May of 1536, the rise of the Berlins would of course explode for all of the wrong reasons. Queen Anne Boleyn and her brother George were arrested on charges of high treason, including the claim that they had indulged in an incestuous relationship. It is here that Jane's story, at least in the eyes of historians, begins to take a major turn. Many believe that by this time, Jane was jealous and bitter of George's good relationship with his sister the Queen, and that this drove her to conspire with the Boleyn enemies to help bring down her husband and the Queen. Many historians stand by this assessment, but really there simply is no strong contemporary evidence to support this. Though the proceedings against Anne, George and the other four men who would die alongside them are fairly well documented, and some individual statements are known, what exactly Jane or anybody else said under questioning was not recorded in detail. Furthermore, during George's trial, Jane was never mentioned, nor was she someone who gave testimony against him in court. It is generally accepted that she would have been interviewed about the supposed conduct of her husband and sister-in-law, but it is impossible to verify what was said because no transcript of the interview survives. There is just one piece of information which concerns Jane which came up and was used against her husband George during his trial. George was handed a piece of paper which he was asked to silently read and then answer yes or no to the question posed to him on the piece of paper. It was in this moment that George threw complete caution to the wind and decided to do the very opposite of what was asked of him, probably knowing already that he was not going to come out of this trial with his life, and so he decided to read the note out loud to the shocked audience of around 2,500 people. The note said that Jane Boleyn had been told by Anne that the king was no good in bed with women and that he had neither potency nor force. The fact that this note was produced, despite it containing deeply embarrassing information about the king, suggests to me that it was either a forgery or came from a different source than Jane Boleyn. I just cannot see Jane Boleyn offering this piece of information up 
for it was such a major slight against the king, and understandably was viewed with nothing but outrage. The other piece of evidence which historians also come back to when they attempt to pin the blame on Jane is the fact that George Boleyn was recorded as saying during his trial that on the evidence of only one woman you are willing to believe this great evil of me and on the basis of her allegations you are deciding my judgment. Now the assumption that historians therefore take is that this one woman George is referring to must be his wife. But why is that so? That, that doesn't actually hold up. What is much, much more likely is that the candidate he was referring to was Elizabeth Somerset, Countess of Worcester, who was scolded by her brother for her apparent loose living. She retorted that she behaved no differently to the Queen and snapped back that I must not forget to tell you what seems to me to be the worst thing, which is that often her brother, meaning George, has carnal knowledge of her in bed. With regard to Jane Boleyn herself, it is of course reasonable to assume that she may have sensed the way the wind was turning, and chose to side with the Boleyn accusers, but again, this just doesn't hold up under close inspection. For if one takes a step back, you have to consider what this would have meant for Jane personally. By now, she had been a Boleyn by marriage for over a decade, and this was an age, whether we like it or not, of staggering patriarchy. Jane's entire existence and position at court ultimately came via her marriage, where she had truly plotted to bring the man down for whom her whole being and purpose rested on. It doesn't make sense. Surely she would have been a supporter of the Boleyn faction, because she was one herself. If they fell, he fell with them. And furthermore, it's well documented that Jane actually worked in support of her husband during his imprisonment, and visited George at the Tower of London to tell him that she was working to try and aid his release. Now to me, these are not the actions of a woman who wanted to see her husband dead. The key thing that we also have to consider here is that the assertion that Jane hated her husband and conspired to bring him down did not come up until long after both Jane and George's deaths. It began with the court writer George Wyatt, a grandson of Sir Thomas Wyatt, the one-time supposed lover of Anne Boleyn before her marriage to the king. George Wyatt described Jane as a wicked wife, accuser of her own husband, even to the seeking of his own blood. Now, subsequent generations of historians also believe that Jane's supposed testimony against her husband and sister-in-law in 1536 was driven solely by spite, as opposed to any real conviction that they were indeed guilty of what they died for. Again, however, there, there just is no proof to back this up. Some have claimed that Jane had a deep-rooted hatred of Queen Anne, which sprang from supposed jealousy at Anne's superior social skills and George's preference to spend time with his sister, but as evidenced by Jane's assistance in the plot to uncover Henry VIII's adultery, there was clearly a strong and trustworthy relationship between the two women. I think it likely that Jane was interviewed by Cromwell during this time and during his plans to bring down the Boleyns and that she may have cracked under the enormous pressure that was being placed upon her. We know, thanks to her later breakdown, which I will come to shortly, that she was a woman who, when under intense pressure, could collapse. And so it's possible that she said things to Cromwell during this time which may have been highly inconsequential but were spun into a web which would end in George and Anne's destruction. Equally here, I think we should also take a step back and look at it from a more macro view. Whilst Jane herself would never even come close to any form of physical torture, it is possible that she was so intimidated by Cromwell and his henchmen that he said things that they then pounced on, again, that were relatively inconsequential. Either way, it would have caused result in her husband beheading, with Queen Anne meeting the same fate and the utter destruction of the Boleyns in Henry VIII's court. With her husband executed as a traitor to the crown, Jane no longer had her social standing and the financial safety net that came with it. She was allowed to continue the use of her Viscountess title, but ultimately withdrew from court and waited for better times. She negotiated an annual income of £100 from her father-in-law, doesn't sound like much today, but it was a fairly decent sum of money back then, which despite being considerably less than she was used to, certainly enabled her to remain a noblewoman of the Tudor court. 
And again, this point to me is further evidence of Jane's non-involvement in the deaths of George and Anne. But why would Thomas Berlin continue to pay her an income if she was central to his house and his children's destruction? Jane's absence from Henry VIII's inner circle appears to have been relatively brief, but she was soon serving as a lady-in-waiting to Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's third wife. During Anne of Cleves' short-lived marriage to the king, which famously lasted just six months, Jane would provide a useful tool for the king when she gave evidence that Queen Anne had confided in her that their marriage had not been consummated, giving Henry enough to be able to annul the marriage with relative ease, also helped by the fact that one of Cleves willingly went off quietly. Jane was soon serving Henry's fifth queen, the teenage Catherine Howard. Catherine was a first cousin of Queen Anne Boleyn, and as a pretty and charming young woman, soon caught the eye of several male courtiers. It is here that Jane's story truly began to take a turn for the worst. Less than two years into the royal marriage, rumours began to circulate that the Queen was conducting extramarital affairs. The two men accused alongside her were Francis Derham, a childhood friend of the Queen, and Thomas Culpepper, a groom of the stool to King Henry. Jane became embroiled in the scandal when it was suggested that she had either been the architect or more likely the facilitator of Catherine's relations with Thomas Culpepper, for it was believed that Jane Boleyn helped smuggle Culpepper into the Queen's chambers during the night. Soon, the Queen and Jane were imprisoned and a lengthy interrogation process began. Under what would have been staggering levels of pressure, Jane suffered a full nervous breakdown, and by 1542, she was pronounced insane. Interestingly, Jane's mental state technically blocked her from standing trial, because under the laws of the time, the insane could not come before a jury and could not suffer execution. However, the king was so determined to see her punished that he pushed through a change in law, which when passed, allowed for judgment to be given. Unlike her late husband George and her sister-in-law Anne, would not be tried before a jury, but was instead found guilty and sentenced to death under an act of attainder, a process which rendered someone guilty of a crime without the need for it to come to trial. Queen Catherine Howard would also suffer the same fate. On the 13th of February, 1542, Jane was beheaded in the precincts of the Tower of London and not before the baying crowds on Tower Hill. It is quite possible that she died on the very same scaffold that Anne Boleyn had done just six years earlier. As the higher ranking of the two, even as traitors, Queen Catherine died first, mercifully with a single blow of the axe. And what I think is often interesting to consider here is that Catherine Howard was the second of Henry VIII's wives to suffer execution, but unlike Anne, no expert executioner from Calais with a sword was called forward. And instead, Catherine, whose guilt was significantly more assured than Anne's, would suffer the axe, which has a ring to it of suggesting perhaps the king himself acknowledged that perhaps he was sending Anne to her death on charges that were, let's say, lax. In a somewhat strange act, the night before her execution, Catherine Howard requested that the block that she would die on the following day to be brought to her chambers so that she could practice laying her head into it, hoping that to do so would make the ordeal seem easier and, and she would be more prepared. After Catherine's death, Jane then followed her mistress to the scaffold and laid her head into the crevice of the block. Despite her nervous collapse, it was said that Jane was calm and dignified, admitted her guilt and asked all of those gathered to pray for her. The end was also mercifully quick, consisting of a single strike of the axe. Although beheading was a quick means of death, and it was, it must have been a terrifying ordeal, particularly for Jane, because it's quite possible that Catherine Howard died mere minutes before she did, and so it's entirely feasible to assume that the scaffold would have been littered with Catherine's blood. Jane was buried in the chapel of St. Peter at Vincula. Her remains were amongst those unearthed during the reign of Queen Victoria. She was buried next to where the remains of Catherine Howard once lay. Sadly, the Queen's bones had completely vanished due to her youth at the time of her death and the presence of limestone in the ground. On Jane's other side were the bones of Lady Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury. Jane Boleyn was aged approximately 36 at the time of her death. 
Jane's death would of course not be the end of her story, for she appears in several films, television shows and books about the Tudor era. Unfortunately, her characterization is perpetually one-sided. Forever characterised as the pantomime villain who got what she deserved, she is shown as spiteful, vindictive and calculating. Only in the Tudors, which played very fast and loose with regard to the facts, is Jane marginally more well-rounded as a character. Her depictions in the BBC miniseries The Six Wives of Henry VIII from 1970, Wolf Hall from 2015, and Anne Boleyn from 2021 are all deeply critical of Jane, showing her, frankly, as a complete bitch who loathes her husband and openly disrespects the Queen. In The Six Wives of Henry VIII, we see a conversation between Jane and George in which she scolds and gelds him as a man. You wish to speak with your sister and not with your wife, I think. I think so, yeah. And I may go hang? As you will, madam. If you could but see beyond her eyes, which would dazzle you, you wouldn't love her and fawn upon her as you do. Mind your tongue, madam. You have spirit in you, no manhood. I've married a jelly. And I a tight-lipped bitch. You knew, sir, when we married. No, I did not. <laughs> you wanted love, my lord. You confound me. I could never love a jelly. In Wolf Hall, she comes off no better, openly fighting with the Queen and daring to not only become violent towards Anne, but denying Anne's queenship altogether. What's to do here? Everyone's been fighting, and all because of that boy Mark. I think he should be dropped from a great height, just like your dog, Pacoy. Do that again and I will hit you back. You're no queen. You're just a knight's daughter. And your time has come. As I mentioned a moment ago, in The Tudors, Jane is rounded out a bit more, but she's also shown as silly and naive, and there's the usual trope of spiteful behaviour towards Anne Boleyn. The show also goes quite hard on the insane part of her story, throwing Jane inside her cell at the Tower of London, covered in what we're led to believe is her own waste. In 2021, the three-part drama Anne Boleyn had Anna Brewster play Jane, and like Wolf Hall, it's a very one-sided Anne. He is a complete cow, basically, and willingly tells Cromwell all that he wishes to hear with regard to her husband's supposed adultery with the Queen. Suffice to say, this, like the show itself, it leaves very little good to be said of Jane's story or character. The one and only time I have seen Jane depicted in a more well-rounded light, one in which she is described and portrayed as human and not a caricature, is not in fiction, but in an amazing documentary about Jane Boleyn herself by Tracy Borman. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you all to track it down, for Tracy highlights so clearly how important Jane was but moreover, why her innocence with regard to the downfall of the Berlins is plain. Jane is one of history's lesser-known figures, but who led an undeniably dramatic life. She has been vilified as a woman determined to bring her husband down, a woman so filled with jealousy and hatred that she would happily play a role in destroying her in-laws. I am forced to conclude, however, that that view simply isn't tenable. The evidence to back it up just isn't there. As I touched on earlier, Jane stood to lose everything if the Boleyns fell from favour, and I can't help but think that in her heart of hearts, she remained loyal to the Boleyn name, and would not have spoken out against them, but the words that she did speak were instead used against her when the time came. Her downfall alongside Catherine Howard is harder to pinpoint. That she was involved in Catherine's liaisons is fairly cut and dry, but her motives are unknown. Was she a voyeur who lived vicariously through the young queen and her lover? Or was she simply following orders? Occam's razor, or Occam's theory as it's known, is the principle that the simplest explanation is often the correct one. And in the case of Jane Boleyn, I think this holds true. I believe that she helped aid Catherine Howard's adultery because she was told to do so. She was a royal servant, and so she did what she was told. For too long, Jane has been characterised as a villain, but that assessment just doesn't feel accurate to me. Her life was extraordinary. She sought so much of Henry VIII's court 
and would pay the ultimate price for her part in it. So was she a villain? No, nor was she a victim. She was a human being who acted in accordance with the times, playing a winning hand for many years, but in the end, as with so many around her, ultimately lost. I welcome the day when we finally see a depiction of Jane in popular entertainment which does justice to this most fascinating and unfairly maligned figure from English history. Thank you all for listening to the Tudor Chess podcast. In addition to this, my weekly episode, I also have a subscriber-only episode which can be found on either Apple Podcasts or via my Patreon account, which is home to all things Tudor Chess. Join me next week when I'll be asking a simple question. Who was the love of King Henry VIII's life? Thank you all and speak soon.